Beyond the path of the utmost sun through utter darkness hurled, further than ever comet flared or vagrant stardust swirled, lived such as fought and sailed and ruled and loved and made our world. The ballads of Rudyard Kipling were one of the great literary phenomena of the late 19th century. This collection, the Barrowcroom Ballads, was the most popular poetry collection in English in terms of sales for nearly 40 years, and were the first poems of Kipling that reached a wide audience and established his name in the public literary consciousness, where he was to remain often heavily contested for several decades. Kipling chose the ballad to depict army life, an old verse form meant to be sung. And these ballads proved irresistible to composers almost as soon as they appeared in print. Kipling was born in 1865 in Bombay, and at the age of six was taken to England by his parents and left for five years at a foster home in South Sea, where he was ill-treated and desperately unhappy. His poor eyesight, mediocre school results, ended his hopes for either a university education or a military career. Kipling returned to India and worked as a journalist in Lahore and Allahabad, a period he later referred to as his seven years hard labor, but which honed his observation and writing skills. 
So at 16 years and nine months, but looking four or five years older and adorned with real whiskers, which the scandalized mother abolished within one hour of beholding, I found myself at Bombay, where I was born, moving among sights and smells that made me deliver in the vernacular sentences whose meaning I knew not. Other Indian-born boys have told me how the same thing happened to them. There were yet three or four days rail to Lahore where my people lived. After these, my English years fell away, nor ever, I think, came back in full strength. On his return to England, he was hailed by some as the literary heir to Charles Dickens. Kipling was determined to make his way as a writer, but also to inform the sunward gazing nation, as he called it, about life in its extended empire. Kipling's early work in India offended the sensibilities of the society, exposing as they did all the its hypocrisies and self-deceptions. Kipling had mixed with all classes and races in India and had an intimate knowledge of the ordinary soldiers, not only the officer class. And it's primarily the lives of these men that make up the content of the ballads. He developed a real and lasting affection for them with no hint of their being patronized. When the ass may be crude, he goes out to the east. He acts like a babe and he drinks like a beast. And he wanders because he is frequent deceased. He is fit for to serve as a soldier. Serve, serve, serve as a soldier. Serve, serve, serve as a soldier. Serve, serve, serve as a soldier. Soldier. And art to my lay, and I sing you a soldier as far as I may. A soldier, what's fit for a soldier? When the cholera comes, as it will, must it not? Keep out of the wet and don't go on the shout, for the sickness gets in as the liquor dies out, and it crumples the young British soldier. The worst of your foes is the sun overhead. You must wear your helmet for all that is said. If he finds you uncovered, he'll knock you down dead, and you'll die like a fool of a soldier. When first under fire and you wish for to duck, don't look nor take heed at the man that is struck. Be thankful you're living and trust to your luck. And a march to your front like a soldier. When half of your bullets fly wide in the ditch, don't call your martini a cross-eyed old bitch. She's human as you are, you treat her as such, and she'll fight for the young British soldier. If your office is dead and the sergeants look white, when to run from a fight, so take open order, lie down and sit tight, and wait for supports like a soldier. Wait, wait, wait like a soldier, wait, wait, wait like a soldier, wait, wait, wait like a soldier, soldier. England was a foreign country for him, but he had the ability to immerse himself in the local atmosphere, a capacity he developed in his wanderings throughout India as a journalist. 
His first lodgings in Villiers Street, next to Charing Cross Station, and opposite Gatti's Music Hall, was almost as exotic as some of the places he had lived in and visited in India. At Gatti's, he was delighted to meet the English brother of the private soldiers he had known in India, who, as he said, sat and sang at my elbow any night I chose. Gatti's opened his eyes to the vitality and energy of these working class people who reveled in the variety of entertainment offered there. Kipling was well aware that although he felt a great affinity for musical audiences, he was not one of them. In a short story, he writes in somewhat patronizing but heartfelt and sincere tones. Someday a man will rise up from Bermondsey, Battersea or Bath. And he will be coarse but clear-sighted, hard but infinitely and tenderly humorous, speaking the people's tongue, steeped in their lives and telling them in swinging, urging, dinging verse what it is that their inarticulate lips would express. He will make them songs, such songs. And all the little poets who pretend to sing to the people will scuttle away like rabbits. For the girl, which, as you have seen, of course, is wisdom, will tell that soldier which is Hercules bow under his labors, all that she knows of life and death and love. Kipling did not share the literary establishment's contempt for popular culture, and like Dickens, frequently celebrated the sentimentality characteristic of Victorian working class society. It was in this context that the first of the Barracoon Ballads appeared in February 1890. It was Danny Deaver. This poem employs the eight-line stanza of the traditional ballad and develops the well-known question and answer form. The circumstances and action are hinted at rather than described in any detail, and the poem stresses Danny's orderliness, which increases the identification of the other soldiers who are forced to watch his execution. He is one of them. They have slept close to him in barracks and shared his beer, and there, but for the grace of God, go they. His death is ritualized. This is a man others have known intimately, and in this brutality of the system is shocking. The military band that accompanied much of life in India is prominent. A dead march accompanies Danny to the scaffold, and a quick step sends the watching troops back to barracks. The most powerfully evocative of several settings of this poem is by German-American composer Walter Damrosch who wonderfully, I think, captures the volatility of mood as reflected in the musical form. And it's said to have been Teddy Roosevelt's favorite song. Right and caught to wine, said 
When the first poem was published in 1890, the army was prominent by virtue of the burst of imperial activity of the last 25 years. The scramble for Africa, as it was called, was reaching its climax. However, the army remained unpopular with both the working and middle classes, with neither feeling the affection that the press was trying to encourage, unlike the near universal affection in which the navy was held. The middle classes were concerned by the cost of maintaining a large army, but also the potential threat it posed if misused by politicians. The working classes were particularly ambivalent. They only joined when unemployment was bad, but the army offered them few usable skills when they were discharged, and the pay was much less than that of a labourer. Ganga Din has acquired a reputation of epitomising racial condescension. But that's certainly not its purpose. Kipling is guilty of the same prejudices as his contemporaries. He reflected the views of the rulers of the Raj and Anglo-Indian society in his early newspaper work. However, this poem asserts the intrinsic worth of people from whatever racial group or religion. Kipling had a genuine belief in the brotherhood of man and was an enthusiastic Freemason. Describing his introduction to the Hope and Perseverance Lodge in Lahore in 1892 in a letter to the Times. I, missed that somewhere. Um, I was secretary for some years of the Lodge, which included brethren of at least four creeds. I was entered by a member from Ramal Somaj, a Hindu, passed by a Mohammedan, and raised by an Englishman. Our Tyler was an Indian Jew. And a goatskin water bag 
attracted to Kipling's verse very early on. His father gave him some Kipling to read, commenting in 1897 that he felt the boy was getting too Teutonic as a result of his studies in Germany. He thought that the Kipling verses would, quote, tickle up the British lion in him. The range of his Kipling settings is wide, as are the forces they often require. Granger would come back to many of the over 50 Kipling settings throughout his life, and was still refining them right at the end. Granger's songs are certainly influenced by his folk song settings. Kipling's treatment of his subjects, the ordinary soldiers, is similar to the folk song Gatherer Granger. Kipling shows the same attention to detail in getting your language, tone, and rhythm absolutely right that Granger does in his folk song trans transcriptions. Granger had some uh, interesting comments regarding the singers of his day. He certainly didn't like trained operatic voices. 
much preferring the folk singers he heard and recorded in his research. No concert singer I have ever heard approach these rural warblers in variety of tone, quality, range of dynamics, or rhythmic resourcefulness and individuality of style. For while our concert singers, dull dogs that they are, with her monotonous mooing and bellowing between mezzo forte and fortissimo, and with never a pianissimo to their name, can show nothing better than, and nothing often as good as, slavish obedience to the tyrannical behest of composers. Our folk singers were lords of their own domain, were at once performers and creators. There are many ideological contradictions that characterize both Kipling and Granger in regard to, the, to their attitudes towards race. By many accounts, both men were rather gentle, generous, and kind in their personal lives, but frequently and consistently expressed extreme racial views, such as the casual anti-Semitism often revealed in their letters. It must be said that some of these views reflected many of the attitudes of the society in which they mixed. Granger's strange views on the superiority of the blue-eyed Nordic races were matched on some level by Kipling's belief in the superiority of the British as the only race capable of providing enlightened rule over other races. Kipling's contradictions are, uh, are emphasized by his lifelong adherence to Freemasonry and belief in the Brotherhood of Man, expressed in his literary output. But his other public and polemical utterances frequently seem to contradict this. Kipling had a long relationship with South Africa and spent nearly every British winter there for nearly 10 years from 1898. He became very friendly with Cecil John Rhodes, the mining magnate, explorer, and later premier of the Cape Colony. Kipling was actively engaged in the early stages of the Boer War as a newspaper correspondent, reverting back to his early career in India. One of, his, one of the most dramatic episodes in his poetry career at the time was his poem, The Absent-Minded Beggar. Written as a vehicle to raise money for the families of the troops who had been sent out to South Africa, published in the Daily Mail, it was immediately successful and recited the musicals by many of the contemporary stars. So Arthur Sullivan's setting was an immediate hit and raised the enormous sum of 250,000 pounds. Both poet and composer had an ambivalent attitude towards their creation. Sullivan noted that, quote, if it wasn't for charity's sake, I could never have undertaken the task. While Kipling described the music as, quote, a tune guaranteed to pull teeth out of barrel organs, adding, I'd shoot the man who wrote it if it would not be suicide. <laughs> the poem is certainly not one of his best efforts, often crude and jingoistic, but its phenomenal success, particularly in its music setting, cannot be denied. And don't feel afraid to join in. <laughs> Left behind him. 
Kipling was offered a knighthood soon after this, but as always, he refused any honors. His poetry was often parodied, often in very vulgar terms, something to which he never dis uh, subscribed. A particular verse came f this particular verse came in for some savage treatment. Albert Chevalier, the great musical uh, artist, was one. Brave fight, vain fight, fight that the strong would shun. Fight without hope or glory, fight that is never won. Battle in filth and squalor, sordid, spiritless fray. Through the roll of the drums, hear the cry from the slums and pay, pay, pay. In the years leading up to the Great War, a strain of authoritarianism suffuses Kipling's poetry, often revealed through a distrust of democratic institutions and the belief that, only, that the nation can only be saved by a strong leader. The tone often becomes harsh, unforgiving, and propagandistic. And there is an almost complete lack of humor, unlike his earlier verse. While Kipling's early ballad poetry was almost exclusively concerned with soldiers and the exploits of the British Army, in the early years of the century, he became more involved with the Navy. And some of the poetry reflects this. Granger had always shown an interest in the sea, and his setting from Kipling's The Seven Seas is a powerful reflection of contemporary politics. The sea wife is Queen Victoria, who sends out her sons to the world. Many do not return. And this is a remarkable setting with a remarkable piano part. <coughs> Oh, 
um, when Kipling's 18-year-old son John was killed soon after arriving in the trenches at the Battle of Luce in September 1915. Initially exempted from combat due to his poor eyesight, Kipling pulled strings with his old friend from South Africa, Lord Roberts Bobbs, and John was drafted into the Irish Guards. There's been much critical speculation regarding the sense of guilt that Kipling felt on the death of his son and how this might be reflected in his work. Oft quoted lines of verse being, if any question why we died, tell them because our fathers lied. <coughs> My boy Jack has resonances with the death of his son. First published on 19th of October 1916, soon after the Battle of Jutland, the largest naval battle of the war. While the result of the battle was inconclusive, the British losses were considerably greater than the Germans. The poem prompted or promoted patriotism and stoicism in the face of the incredible losses both on land and sea. The great contralto of Dan Clara Butt invited Sir Edward German to set it to music, and it was set with piano and orchestral accompaniment and was an immediate success. Clara Butt was capable of doing full justice to the vividly melodramatic style and emotional projection that the song called for. Standing six foot two, she was famed for a booming voice. Sir Thomas Beecher once said that on a clear day, she could be heard across the English Channel. And during the war, she was immensely popular as a concert performer of patriotic songs and, and ballads, including My Boy Jack, which remained at the center of her repertoire. We'll try not to move across the channel. <laughs> Comfort can I find? What 
Uh, the First World War seemed to sap much of the energy from Kipling. And although he remained a vocal political polemicist, some of the fire seems to have gone. Much of his literary output, though, takes on a more abstract element at this stage, and there's, this is the period when many of his most highly regarded short stories were written. Some have argued that he was and remains the greatest exponent of the short story in English. Kipling had always loved children, and many accounts paint a picture of Kipling surrounded by a group of children with him inventing stories on the spot. Friends were well aware that he would disappear for large, long stretches of time when they came to visit. And they would later discover him surrounded by an adoring and enraptured young audience. The Just So stories were written in a period leading up to 1902 when Kipling and family were in South Africa and set to music by Edward German. Million 
serving men who get no rest at all. She sends them abroad on her own affairs from the second she opens her eyes. One million pounds, two million pairs, and a seven million
factor of variable balance that one should find in return. The picture of a long forgotten period remains fresh for us in these poems. As George Orwell almost grudgingly noted, but from the body of Kipling's early work, there does seem to emerge a vivid and not seriously misleading picture of the old pre-machine gun army, the sweltering barracks in Gibraltar or Lucknow, the red coats, the pipe clay belts and the pillbox hats, the beer, the fights, the floggings, hangings and crucifixions, the bugle calls, the smell of oats and hospice, the bellowing sergeants with foot-long moustaches, the bloody skirmishes invariably mismanaged. The crowded troop ships, the cholera stricken camps, the native concubines, the ultimate death in the workhouse. It's a crude, vulgar picture in which a patriotic musical turn seems to have got mixed up with one of Zola's warrior passages. But from it, future generations will be able to gather some idea of what a long term volunteer army was like. On about the same level, they will be able to learn something of British India in the days when motor cars and refrigerators were unheard of. Both Granger and Kipling are a web of contradictions, but in the end, it is the art that remains. Granger lived a life of extremes, sometimes not in control of his boundless energy, while Kipling, after his stint in India, was a model of middle-class rectitude. In this year of the bicentenary of Richard Wagner, it's perhaps imperative that the final focus is on the art and not the man. Their lives reflect and inflect their work, of course and they are both products of difficult childhoods. Both, to a lesser or greater degree, almost always saw themselves as outsiders in whatever environment they were. And perhaps it is this tension which gives their work such power and sustains its longevity, but will also continue to fuel the controversy that still surrounds them. The Ballad Mandalay was published in 1819. He challenged the dominant assumption of the contemporary Orientalist discourse that the West was always superior to the East. The line, if you were the East according, you are never ignored else, certainly calls these attitudes into question, as does much of Kipling's work. Even though the ballad was written in 1890, there is a sense of finality and nostalgia, perhaps even a sense of loss. Uh, and it might be possible to think of Kipling looking back at the end of his life with a similar affection for his time in the East. Certainly it was the period that shaped him as a writer and as a man. It seems fitting to end with the famous setting by Holy Speaks, which remains the best known and loved setting of all his songs.
Schmerz, von dem spicy garlic smells, and the sunshine and the palm trees and the tickly Oh, my God.